And the title of my message this evening is, What is a Sodomite and what does it matter? You know, there's, there's all this talk. I just got back from uh, 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 Orlando, Florida at Revival Baptist Church, and there's all this talk this month about the Sodomites. And very well, uh, and we have the very right to do so because we need people and we need preachers and individuals to take a stand against this. But the reason that, well, at least me, the reason I'm preaching so much about it or at least much more than before on it this month is because if they're going to spend a whole month telling us about their filth and perversion, then it's a good thing for us to tell the world about why that filth and perversion causes so much destruction and why it's not even worth it to spend our time trying to lead them to the Lord and so many other consequences. But, you know, one of the things you hear is that you hear things like there's gay bashing and that we uh, were violent and we're bigots and we're terrorists. You know, the other day somebody called me a domestic terrorist. But let's just look at what the Bible says about sodomites. And, you know, this is a great story here in the Bible that just tells us uh, very uh, very vividly, it paints a, a clear picture of what God thinks of the Sodomites and how they are. And I mean, we're going to go into all the verses to describe, not all the verses, but a lot of verses to describe them. But the main thing is, number one, what is a Sodomite? And the number two thing we want to answer is, what does it matter? I mean, does it really matter for us to get up behind a pulpit and preach so much? I mean, do we, are we just that hateful in the sense of the world's definition. I mean, God hates things, but the world makes us, uh, point, uh, paints us out as uh, these evil, uh, uh, basically like uh, warmongers who just want to go out there and cause genocide. Now, I've studied a little bit of history. I don't know history perfectly. I'm not a, like, a history scholar, but you know, those uh, tyrants and those uh, dictators that ruled the world in the past that were for genocide, they had nothing to do with God, and they weren't preaching anything other than their selfish desire to destroy the world and conquer it. But here, God specifically wants us to go out and conquer the world in a different way. He wants us to go out there and lead the souls of men and women to eternity, but there is stumbling blocks along the way. And one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we're going to run to is the sodomite. You know, it's not just because of their lifestyle, but it's because of their mind style. It's what, it's what they think. It's what they do. It's how they act. It's how they're deceptive. It's how they, uh, it's how they uh, abuse and defile and just destroy the lives of many people that otherwise could have been saved by Jesus Christ. See, we, we have a battle, and they're basically on the opposite side of the spectrum. And you see that either we're leading them to Christ or they're leading them to hell and making them twofold to child of hell. And the world is, is lost right now, and they just need a Savior. And as long as they're lost and they're looking, everything's all good and dandy if, if we come by and knock on their door. But if one of these individuals takes a hold of them and abuses them and messes them up to the point where they're now going to get to a, a series of decisions that will that'll lead them to reject Christ, well, then these guys are basically proselytizing for evil. They're proselytizing to hell, and they're willing to take anybody with them. But I didn't, you know, I mean, maybe that's a longer introduction than I anticipated. But it's an important introduction because, you know, there's all this talk and all these individuals, and it's just, you know, what do you mean? God is love. He loves everybody. You know, you've got Baptists backing. Uh, the Sodomites, you've got Presbyterians back in the Sodomites, you've got all these false religions, nobody really wants to stand for truth, there's people in the world that think it's disgusting, but they're just too afraid to say anything because, you know, of the damage that it could cause them, it could affect their careers and their lives and everything, and the reality is, it, it, it shouldn't matter because the, we need to go out there and protect society from these individuals. So, what I'm going to do, or the goal of tonight, is to give you a proper definition of what is a Sodomite biblically. Because it's not just like how we, were, how we grew up, you know, when we played games like Smear the Queer or, you know, that guy was effeminate so we just, you know, people would pick on him or maybe he got beat up. No, we're going to give you the biblical definition that goes deep into the, do like, their, their deception and their doctrine, their belief system of what they think is truth, which is actually the biggest lie from the devil, you know, and how they worship the creation, I mean the creation more than the creator, and how they eventually end up reprobate. Because one of the things you hear is we, we throw that term around a lot, we, we preach about reprobates a lot, but inside of the reprobate doctrine are the sodomites. 
And the Sodomites are a specific group of people that cause a lot of damage. So anyways, let's go there to verse 5 of Genesis 19. And in verse 5 it says, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And so we're going to get to those verses in Romans. In Romans 1, the famous verses about the natural use. But immediately here, you know, we can always go back to Genesis, Genesis 9, you know, in the, in the story of Noah and how one of his sons took advantage of him. But uh, right here, we, uh, we're looking and it says, bring them unto us that we may know them. Now, the Bible is very, uh, it's, it's, a pure, it's a pure word, Psalms tells us. It's a righteous word. It's the word of God. And the Bible tells us that thy word is truth and that Jesus is the word. So God's never going to paint a picture that's so vivid that it's going to have us take part in foolish thoughts or sinful thoughts. So the only thing you need to know is that this is not that we may know them, like we're, I'm trying to knock on someone's door and get to know them. I'm not, this is not a survey. This is not a series of questions. They didn't go out for coffee. This is not a, a steak and a dinner. This is not anything like that. The, this is just the, the idea of getting to know them intimately. They want to do things to them that, you know, we would never do. Things that are disgusting and perverse. And that's why we get the, that's where we get the term sodomite. You know, it's a, it's a sodomizing of an individual. And this is what these individuals are. They, they, they're going after the angels. And what they're telling a lot is, look, we saw these two individuals. And not only, not only did we see them, they're new to town and we want to get to know them. And verse 6 says, And Lot went out that door unto them, and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now, a couple of things, it's always so important. You know, I remember growing up and re reading the story and just thinking like, why, why would it be okay to write that, like for Lot to be able to do that? But the one thing is we have to read the Bible and learn who these individuals are. And this is a great example of someone who's saved, but they're just off the beaten path. You know, they're, they're not leading a righteous life. And so Lot doesn't have biblical solutions. Lot doesn't have, uh, you know, the Word of God in his heart all the time to give these guys a, a sharp rebuke. Instead, what he does is he reaches to the world for answers. He said, look, if, you're, if you want these guys, I know they're pure and I, I know enough to know this is not a good thing, so I'm going to give you the next best thing. But they, uh, right here, it says, and they said, stand back. And they said, again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now we will deal with, worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Another thing we see is, that they're just implacable. We're going to get to those verses, but they didn't care. And not only did they not care, the minute that they got opposition, they're like, not only are we going to do it to them, but we're going to, we're going to do worse to you. So they're vicious individuals. These sodomites are people who have an unnatural use. They have unnatural desires, and that unnatural desire makes them have no conscience. And we're going to see those verses here shortly. But, I mean, right here, this is just nuts what's going on, right? It says... But the men put forth their hand uh, uh, and said, uh, verse, they said, stand back and said again, uh, verse 9, I mean, verse 10. But the men put forth their hand and put Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, smote small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-laws and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. And so we see the rest of the stories where they're getting them out. But you see that even after they're blinded, they didn't care. They continued to go after the house. They had only one objective and it was not a natural objective. You know, if I got blinded right now in the middle of this sermon, I'd probably, no, not I'd probably, I would stop the sermon and I'd ask one of you to help me and I'd, I'd be pretty concerned about the fact that I'm blind. I'd take me to the emergency room, what happened, this is just, I, I've never experienced this, I've, I must have eaten something, I must have some kind of disease, what's going on, am I dying? These guys were blinded, and they're like, let's continue going, let's just continue fighting, 
Let's continue pressing. Let's continue going forward. So this sets up the verses that we're going to go through and cover just a couple of points. I, tonight I won't be able to cover the entire thing. And uh, we're not going to be able to cover all the aspects of it. But uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to go point by point and cover what it is uh, to be a sodomite. Like what, what is a sodomite and what does it really matter? So if you'll turn there to Leviticus 18 uh, and you're going to be there in verse 22. Turn to Leviticus 18, verse 22. Before we get to the three points, the very first thing we're going to see is, what is a sodomite? So Leviticus 18, verse 22, tells us that uh, it gives us a description. So let's be very specific, because it's not just everybody. Verse 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So we see right here, and I'm going to read a couple more verses just to kind of show you what it leads to. It says, Neither shall thou, thou, shall thou lie, down, lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomited out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. And notice that, part, that verse right there says, all these abominations. The land spew you not, that the land not, uh, that the land spew you, spew not you out also, when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore ye shall keep my ordinance, that ye commit not any of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. And we see that the very first thing that's very simple, and this is the basic definition, and then from there you're going to see the perversion that it leads to, is that verse 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind is an abomination. We're going to get into more specific verses, but it says, One man should not be attracted to another man, and one woman should not be attracted to another woman. It's unnatural. It is an abomination. And what it does is it leads to other things. You know, we see now that they're making a push for pedophilia. You know, where adults have an unnatural affection for children. And then we're seeing now also that they're going to eventually have an unnatural use for animals. You know, the Bible describes them as beasts, as animals, as dogs, as brute beasts. Let's go to Leviticus 20, verse 13. And, you know, we're covering, these are, are, are not uh, unfamiliar verses to the world. These are the ones that they don't like. The world does not like this scripture. These, they don't like these verses, and that's why they're fighting it so much. Verse 13 says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with the fire, both he and they, what, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death. And he shall, lie, and he shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, Thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So again, we see that it's an unnatural use. Romans will clear that up for us. We're going to be there. But, I mean, this is not rocket science. And, and I mean, honestly, this is the type of sermon that's actually kind of uh, weird to preach in the sense, not weird, but just uh, almost a nuisance to preach because it should be pretty obvious that if you're born a boy, you're attracted to a girl. And if you're a girl, you're attracted to a boy. I mean, this is kind of like uh, one plus one equals two, but the world keeps telling us that one plus one equals five, or that one plus one equals a square, or that one plus one equals yellow. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. This, I mean, it's almost, I almost felt silly when I was typing this sermon up, because I'm like, is this really relevant in today's day? But you know, going on today, this weekend, next weekend, over the, the next uh, 15 days or 16 days that are left in the 14 days that are left in the month, guess what they're going to continue celebrating? Pride Month. The abomination of this sick, perverse sin. You know, just down here in Houston, we have Montrose, and they're going to have a long, big parade displaying this filth. 
It's displaying this vile affection. And if the government uh, did their job, they would get rid of them. They would kill them. And let me make the, you know, I, now all us Baptists that preach this have to make the disclaimer. If we had a righteous government, they should put them to death. It is not my duty, and it is not the duty of anybody that is an independent fundamental Baptist or a safe by grace uh, believing Christian that it knows that they have eternal life to go out there and take the law into their hands. That's being a vigilante. The Bible actually has rules about that, has laws about that. So it's not for me to go out there and, and take it upon myself to go out there and destroy these people. God's going to destroy them. We know the end of the story. He's going to wickedly burn them in hell for all eternity. But it is our duty to speak out against it. And at least maybe we can push them back in the closet or at least we can keep them away from our families. Keep that filth off from our eyes. But the reality is that they should be put to death. Not only does it say it in Leviticus 20, 20, 13, but if we go to Romans 1, verse 26, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And that recompense is death. You know, and we're going to see those verses here later. We're going to go back to Romans. But the very first thing I wanted to do, and I got ahead of myself a little bit, is just the basic definition. He says, why did he give them up to vile affections? Because even the women did change the natural use, which is against nature. It says, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. So it's not just enough that they have an attraction, but they burn in their lusts one towards another. Men are working with men that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, they're doing things that we, we can't even comprehend. They're doing things that we should not comprehend. You know, it, it's just not a natural thing what they're doing. I remember many years ago, about 20 years ago when I was in college, I went to, uh, on an internship, to a business internship to Germany. And when we were there, um, you know, we stayed with, with other German students in their, in their apartments. They split us up and, you know, obviously this is 20 years ago, so men would still be put with other men and women. They split up the men and the women so that there's not, uh, and this is a secular school, but they were trying to keep everybody, you know, as, uh, as clean as they could for the world. You know, they, uh, this is not a Christian university or anything like that. So that, the, they knew what was going on, but if they can avoid it, they would. But uh, long story short, I remember one time we went to a reunion, or one of the days that we were there, we went to a reunion, and I asked the host of the, of the party, the person that lived there, if I could use the restroom. And uh, she turned to me and she said, yeah, you know, here's the restroom. And she said, oh, in Germany, the men sit down on the toilet because, you know, it's cleaner that way. And so when you go to the toilet, please sit down. I remember going to the restroom and I just... You know, I just went and, uh, you know, did my business standing up. And I'm, you know what business I'm talking about. I don't want to be, like, disgusting or anything, but I just, I just had to, uh, you know, go urinate. I mean, let's be honest. I, I'm not trying to be disgusting. I, just, I had to go urinate. Men, you know, they piss against the wall, as the Bible says, they, standing up. I just had to go urinate. And, and I, I think to myself, man, how is she going to know, first of all, if I didn't sit down? And then second of, of all, the reason that I didn't do it was because it felt unnatural. It just wasn't a natural thing ever since I've been a child, ever since I've been able to, you know, use the, the restroom by myself, you know, as a man, if I just need to go number one, I just, it's standing up. I, I don't know that, that I've ever had to, that I ever thought, well, I need to sit down for this, for this duty. It wasn't a natural thing. God has put that instinct in men that when we go do that, we stand up. You know, and I'm not trying to be disgusting here, but when women go do that, they sit down. That's the natural way of things. And right here is saying that you're doing it unnaturally. It would make sense now, 20 years later, now that I'm saved and I've seen things and I understand the Bible better, why they would ask me to sit down. You know, they're the ones that are promoting these types of lifestyles, these unnatural lifestyles, at least to even the simplest thing. You know, think about how effeminate and how weird it would be for a guy to do that every time. I mean, that's just 
weird. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent. But the point I was trying to make is just the like-mindedness of, you know, something so dumbing it down to, I guess, the ridiculous is if that seems unnatural, how could you get to the point of something so vile and wicked? Let's look at the last verse and then, and then we'll go into our points there. in Deuteronomy 23, 23, 17 says, There shall be no whores of the daughter of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both of these are abomination unto the Lord. And this is the other important point. Number one, they, they leave the natural use. That means that the one thing that, 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 it, that, it, that we'll see here is not only do they leave the natural use, and that's why I use Genesis 19, but they're willing, and Judges 19 will also show us that, and if we have 10, we might go there, but they, they're going back and forth. But then the other thing is the Bible likens them to dogs. There's another set of verses that likens them to the brute beasts. And so what, it, what, what you need to understand is dogs or animals don't have conscience. You know, sorry to break it to those Disney lovers, you know, that are obsessed with Disney, but no, dogs do not go to heaven. They're just animals without a conscience. Just read 1 Corinthians 15. That's another sermon for another day. But when you're, so when you're looking and you're talking about these individuals, they're lusting or burning in their lust one for another. They're leaving the, unnat the natural use for an unnatural use, and they've just become basically walking animals. You know, that's why the, 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 the evolution, the religion of evolution, evolution is so dangerous because it tells you that you're an animal and then if you start thinking you're an animal, guess what? You're going to start acting like one. And when you get to the point where God rejects you, guess what? You are one. And that's the dangerous part about a sodomite is that you're dealing with an animal. And how, how do you deal? You know, I, I grew up and I, we always had labs. We had a husky one time, but... Huskies are really difficult to deal with in 100-degree in weather. By the way, if you're ever going to buy a dog, don't buy a husky for 100-degree weather. They, just, they don't know what to do out of their element. But we had dogs growing up, and dogs are disgusting. I mean, if you leave a dog to its own devices, it's going to do all kinds of wicked stuff. But it's a dog. It's an animal. I mean, you don't judge it like you judge a man. But, you know, the only way to control it is you have to hold it. You have to know. It has to know where its authority is coming from. It has to know that there is a leader that's not going to back down. You know, if a dog gets aggressive, if you show fear, you know what a dog's going to do? It's going to smell that fear. It's going to bite you, and it could maul you, and it could even kill you. But if you stand your ground, it's all just bark and no bite. And that's really how you have to attack a sodomite when they're coming at you, because they're just big, sissy bullies. And, if you, and, and this is why it's so important to talk about what is a sodomite and what does it matter. Because the first thing, and this is not even on my points, it's just come off the top of my head. One of the main things that it does is if you know who you're dealing with, that you know how to deal with them. You know, we're not going to go out there and have a, uh, 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 a rehabilitation uh, uh, ministry for them. You know, uh, Brother Bobby, he is part of AA and he brings in a lot of people that are in rehab for drug use. We're not going to do that for the sodomites because they're dogs. You know, I've never tried to sit there next to any of the dogs that we had and think, oh, this guy's my friend. You know, I can have a conversation with him. We're, we're one and the same. We're equal. No, I always knew it was a dog. And if a dog didn't serve its purpose, then you take it to the vet and you put it down. And if, if you're in the ranch, then, you know, you put it down the way it's supposed to. And people are going to get offended about that. Because the other thing you see about these brute beasts is they relate to the beast and they love their animals more than they love people. You know, if you kill a dog, these sodomites get all, they're, uh, they're, uh, they get all in arms and they, they're crying wolf and, you know, basically wanting to throw everybody in jail and destroy them. But nobody cares about the thousands of children that we kill every day in the womb because people want to give supposedly a woman a choice. All right. But let's go to the three points so we can, we can close this out. I don't want this to run long. Point number one, it matters because it solidifies your authority. You know, many years ago when I was learning tasks, and I've heard this more than once, not only from my dad, but from even business leaders, anybody, they were like, look, if you have a series of tasks that you have to do in a day and you're feeling overwhelmed, start with the hardest one first. Because when you, when you finish the hardest one, then everything else is just kind of like a bonus. It's a smooth sailing. And probably the hardest one is, is the most important one. 
So, you know, in, in, if, if tomorrow I wake up for my business and I know I have to make some tough phone calls and I have to organize my emails and respond to some emails and maybe check, organize my desk, the first thing I should do is get rid of those calls, then the rest is just a bonus. Most people go the opposite. They'll want to organize their desk and clean out their emails. And you come, hey, did you make that call? Did you make that important phone call? And they're like, no, no, I haven't gotten to it because I've been fixing it. And by the end of the day, they didn't do it. And guess what? It probably is detrimental to your business or the task that you're trying to accomplish. Well, for us, this is probably the most important topic because these are the hardest topics to talk about in the Bible. You know, the hard sins are the ones that make people uncomfortable. If you start with the hardest part first, then it matters because it solidifies your authority. Look, either your authority is in the Word of God. You're saying this, this word is pure to me. This is God's word. This is my authority on all matters of faith and practice of my life and everything that I do, all my decision making, or it's not. And if it's not, then you know what? You really need to get rid of it and just do whatever you want because you're always going to be at odds with it because you're going to want to love one thing from it, but you're going to hate the other. And that's kind of what's happening with society today is that the reason that everybody's so confused about what a sodomite is is because they're looking at the world to define what a sodomite is. Look, if you just look at the Bible and you say, I uh, believe 100% that this is the Word of God, that this is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, then you're going to believe everything it says. Whether you agree with it or not is independent of that, but you're going to believe it. And if the Bible says that this is unnatural, that they're brute beasts, that they're dogs, that you know they're burning their lust one for another, then all of a sudden you start taking that distance from them. I mean, you just, in just natural instinct would be separation. I'm not even talking about picking that spiritual fight with them yet. I'm just talking about if, if you're not even there in your spiritual walk, this should be enough to just separate you from them. To say, look, I'm sick and tired. I'm going to at least say that if, if I'm not going to publicly tell people to stop promoting this pride uh, parade and I'm not going to stop sending my money the wrong way. And I'm talking about a spiritual walk. We're going to get to the end and just don't get ahead of me. But if I'm not going to do any of that, at least I should separate myself from them because God's word is true. But see, most people want to start with the easy part and then just they never get to the hard part. And they never get to the hard part because they're too busy trying to figure out the easy part. They have, you know, paralysis by analysis. It's like the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And they're like, well, let's analyze that sucker. Let's just look at it and look at it. And look, once you're saved, you're saved. Now it's time to grow. But they just want to stay on that verse. And, they, and every time that uh, they're in church, they have an altar call. And every time they go to church, it's a, just a variation of the gospel message. And, and they're always preaching Jesus that, hey, I'm... I'm all for preaching Jesus, but guess what? If you don't preach all the Word of God, then you're, you know, you're just going to see a bunch of uh, reprobates just walking on the earth that eventually are going to be reprobates in hell. You know, everybody that's in hell is a reprobate. That means they're rejected and they're not loved by God. God hates them, the Bible tells us. You know, and I wish I could go into those verses, but go to, go to Titus. Go to Titus 2. Go to Titus 2. And, and let's see what the Word of God tells us about His authority. What the Word of God tells us about His Word and why we should start with the hardest part first. As a matter of fact, I think it's so important to just have someone, you know, as they're learning about the spiritual milk and they're being sincere, they're babes in Christ. Hey, let's, let's give you something difficult to swallow in the process. Let's start testing that digestive system for the meat. You know, you, you go from, from uh, fruits to, to, to solids. There's really no smooth transition. I mean, you go from, because the fruits are just liquid. You're just liquefying everything from them. It's liquid, liquid, liquefying to solids. You go from liquids to solids with kids. Well, that's how it's got to be here. You're giving them sincere milk. You're giving them spiritual milk. But guess what? You also got to give them some of that solid food. And they might not understand it at first. It might make them uncomfortable. But one of the things they need to know is that the person standing behind the pulpit, or at least the congregation, has the backbone to talk about this stuff. You know, go to Titus 2, let's not get, a, let's, let's not get um, sidetracked. It says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. You know, this, these verses apply to Pastor uh, Fritz. Pastor Fritz is the pastor of uh, All Scripture Baptist Church, and he served as the, uh, he was in the, as a detective, a homicide detective at that, for the, ca the, the, the county there, the Knox County. And as soon as they heard his sermon on Leviticus 20.13, they went after him, and apparently the DA and the mayor, they're all looking into uh, you know, all his cases because now they know where he stands on the Word of God, which shouldn't be that, that, uh, that weird to them, but it is. But the one thing that you're seeing in the articles is they keep bringing out his work record, and, and he has a, a, an outstanding work record. As a matter of fact, at one point he was even employee of the month because it says, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil to say of you. See, they don't have evil to say of him, so the only thing that they could probably do is bring a false witness just like they did to Jesus. And that's a possibility. He knows it. I know it. We all know it. It could happen to any of us. It says, verse 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, the truth of God, our Savior in all things. For, by, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us all from iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. See, no man will despise you if you speak with, uh, if you speak these things and you exhort and you rebuke with all authority. And it makes perfect sense because men will not despise you. You know who will despise you? Brute beasts. These are not men and women walking around. They're dogs. So if they despise you, I mean, it doesn't matter because it's not contrary to the word of God. It says here, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. You know, we were walking down to go sowing and some guy stopped. You know, he was in his car and I was with uh, one of the brothers from uh, uh, New Jersey, brother Aaron Ford. And the guy rolled down his window. He says, hey, we appreciate what you're doing. And I know that they knew who we were because they were in the news all last week. You know, Revival Baptist Church was. So they recognized the soul winners because that's what they said they do. So when they saw us in the street, they said, hey, we appreciate what we do. What you do for, 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 everything, for us and for the people. You know, they didn't despise us. Those brute beasts did. Go to Psalm 56, and then uh, we're going to go to 2 Timothy 3, Psalm 56. And actually, just go to, to 2 Timothy 3. Uh, that way we, 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 we can get uh, for the time's sake. But it says, to the chief musician, and I, I might butcher this, that long name. To the chief musician upon Jonathan, Jonathan Elamero Chokim, Miktem of David, when the Philistines took him in Gath, be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. See, the world's going to fight you because you're standing on the authority. But let's see what the Bible says. It says, Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Why is he not fearing? Even though he said before he, when, he had a, when he feared, because he's putting his trust in the word of God. See, this is the, it matters because we have to establish our authority. And there's no better way to establish it than when you're doing the hardest thing. You know, David's not talking that he's trusted in God when he's sitting there by the pool, you know, eating his grapes. And, I, and I'm using that example because, you know, we see images of kings like that. I don't know if David did that or not. But what I'm saying is that's not where, where he's doing it. He's doing it when he's being oppressed. Let's go to verse 5. It says, Every day that they rest my words and their thoughts are against uh, me for evil. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity and thine anger cast down the people, O God? 
Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. In God will I praise his word, in the Lord will I praise his word. In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will now thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. And we see that he's putting his trust in his, his authority is the word of God. You know, he didn't listen to what man said and that, you know, protesters will show up and people will call you vile things and they're going to insult you and they're going to reproach you and they're going to persecute you for God's name. No, he said, I'm putting my trust in, in, in your word. The authority is in God's word. Let's see what 2 Timothy 3, verse 10 says. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, and let's go to verse 10, says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea... And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax, wor wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So not only are they <laughs> deceiving, but they're also being lied to, which is, you know, that's how you got all these sodomite sympathizers. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned as, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I think it's interesting that, you know, people use this verse a lot, but, I, you know, what's interesting is how it ties with the first few verses in the top. It's that, you know, this is the set of verses that people quote to say, but yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And then he reminds us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In other words, if we know that this is the authority, then we know the result. We know that we will suffer these things, but we also know that he will deliver us from these things. And this is our authority, so it matters for us to know the basics. And for me, sodomy is the, is the theme of the Bible that we have to deal with, that we have to endure with, that we have to spiritually fight against. You know, the, here we see that it matters because it solidifies our authority. If we start with the hardest thing, the rest will come easy. But see, most churches, most preachers, most independent, fundamental Baptist preachers don't want to touch this topic with a 10-foot pole. I mean, I went to this thing, and I was thinking about it, and I thought to myself, there's probably thousands of independent Baptist churches. I, I, if you notice, I did that on purpose. I skipped that fundamental. And there's probably, let's just go to hundreds of independent, fundamental Baptist churches. And there was probably 10 preachers at that conference. I think six of them preached. If I recall correctly, it was six, plus Pastor Boyle, seven. And then there was probably 300, 400 people at that event over the two-day period, plus whatever uh, was there today because Pastor Boyle is closing it out. And I think to myself, where are all these men that say they're KJV? You go to their website and they're KJV only. Look, if you're KJV only, how can you ignore this? I mean, how is this like not part of what you teach? How is this not part of what you believe? How is this not part of how you deal with these issues in your life? I mean, it's all right there. So it matters because it defines our authority. Like it sets who, what we believe in. You know, people will call us crazy. People think that I'm nuts because I tell them that the only authority in my life is, is the word of God. But I mean, for me, I'd rather the world think I'm crazy and God think I'm sane than the opposite, right? I don't want him to think I'm a dog. And you know, by the way, I'm saved, so I, I'm, not, I'm not ever in danger of that. But I wouldn't want him to think me a dog or a brute beast. You know, number two, and we're almost done here, it says it matters because all sodomites are reprobates. And I'm actually taking this, I love this quote. I, I'm taking this quote from Pastor Jimenez. I, I learned this, or, 
or it was a, a good way to describe what we know, but it, it matters because all so sodomites are reprobates, but it all, not all reprobates are sodomites yet. So, you know, people want to argue that reprobate doctrine, and then they get mad, and they're like saying, so you're saying that all reprobates are sodomites. Well, no, but I am saying all sodomites are reprobates. But the reality is, if you read Romans 1, which we're going to see right here, all reprobates will, if they live long enough, will eventually end up sodomites. And we should fight against it. And we should war against it. And we should speak about it against it. You know, and it matters because... This is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but it became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves." who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men, with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as, the, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So this is the reprobate doctrine right here. So you say, well, are all reprobate sodomites? Well, all sodomites are reprobates. We see that. And it and just give it long enough and they'll be sodomites. So, I mean, we need to fight this battle because that is the reprobate. And, I mean, I wish we could go into it, but I, I just wanted to give you the basic definition. But there's so much more to say. I mean, these are people that don't care. They're psychopaths. You know, they're like the serial killers that you've heard of from the past. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer and, um, you know, individuals like that of the likes. I, and, and, man, I, and I've, I, the, the names elude me right now, but... You know, these individuals that will just go out there and murder. You know, a couple years back we had a, serial, a Hispanic serial killer here in Texas that would kill people on trains and then just go about his business. I remember uh, one time reading about a, a mob enforcer who murdered hundreds of people. And I remember watching an interview from this guy, which I remember I, I, I didn't plan on. This just came to my remembrance right now. But look it up it's a mafia guy that he was uh, basically the the hitman he was the enforcer for the mafia and he got paid very well to do do this and he had a wife and he had kids and the neighbors everybody that talked to him thought he just had a regular job he just said that he was you know just in the he, he a regular old job i don't remember what he told people his title was he had a house and a car he would leave at eight o'clock in the morning and then he would come home at five. He would literally schedule his murders and the way that he, he heard people for the mafia during work hours. And he just said that he traveled for business. He wore a suit when he left for work. He came back with a suitcase and stuff. I mean, he, he played the part legitimately. His wife and kids did not know that this, is, that this guy did all this. And then, and then he, he just, he, he was interviewed and he actually, he never denied it. He described the murders and they asked him, did you ever feel bad? He's like, I was just doing my job. 
I, I mean, I was just, I, I just, I just, that was what they asked me to do. I never felt, you know, bad about what I did. If they asked me to take somebody out, I just did it and then went home and took care of my family. You know, and this went on for years, just decades. I think it was like 20 years of this before they ever caught him because this guy just seemed like Joe Blow, like my neighbor, like this guy that I just invited over for a barbecue and, you know, I, we gave him some sandwiches and we hung out and maybe watched the football game. That's how they described him. They, nobody could believe that this guy was so evil so wicked. You know, reprobates are like that. These individuals, don't let them fool you into thinking that they're sweet little, you know, just fairies that like to walk around and like good fashion and decorating and colors. No. They're like this individual that I'm describing. They'll do things, wicked things, and then go to work and act like they're your best friend and not even think about the damage that they just caused the day before, or the night before, or the morning before, or whenever they did it. And guess who they're targeting? Your children. My children. And I'm going to tell you something. You know, I love my children. I don't want anything bad to happen to them, and I want to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So just on that, just on that point alone, that's why I wouldn't want to hang around with these guys. Because God's Word says that they're evil and that they're full of all of this. All of these sins. I wish I could just go into detail on all this stuff in Romans 1. But I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but it matters because all sodomites are reprobates, but not all reprobates are sodomites yet. You know, I love that verse, for God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I always make that emphasis that yet means that you're still continuing to do that. You know, I, I use that because it says they're not sodomites yet, but eventually they're going to continue in that lifestyle of doing all that wickedness that they're going to get there. It, that yet they're just continuing down that path. Because God's already given them up to vile affections. And you know, it matters because we are to pull others out of the fire before they get there. You know, we went out soul winning today. We went out soul winning over the conference. And our whole goal is to lead people to Christ. But if we run into someone, you know, one of the people that we did run into today was a young girl. And as she was walking in, she had a, a rainbow flag draped over her and her dad. And people say that we're not loving I made the attempt to give her the gospel because I don't know if she's a sodomite or a sodomite sympathizer. If she's a sympathizer, she might have a chance. If she's a sodomite, it's too late, right? But I'm not going to invite her to church. I'm definitely not going to ask her to reform her ways. I'm not going to ask her that there's a chance for her to get saved if that was her lifestyle. But I'm not also going to make that assumption because we're pulling people out of the fire. It matters because we're pull people out of the fire before they get there. Go to Jude and we're going to close this out. Jude 1, I mean Jude 1, well Jude only has one chapter. Jude, verse 17. But I guess for the sake of consistency, Jude, we could be Jude 1. It, it is one chapter. But the Bible says there in verse 17, it says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you, that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. And by the way, Jude talks about the Sodomites. Just a few verses before, you know, even in this, they're walking after their ungodly lust. And guess what? They're making fun. It was wicked. You know, I saw those protesters for like two seconds and my eyes, you know, I, I can't unsee what I saw. Luckily, they didn't do anything too vile, but it was enough for me to go back inside the building. I didn't even want to deal with it. It was disgusting. And they're mocking. It says, verse 18 says, how that they told you, how that they told you that there should be mockers who should walk after their own lust. Verse 19, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. So you can't keep yourself in the love of God if you don't preach the hate of God. Right? And the Bible tells us to hate sodomites. And so, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion making a difference. See, if you really have the love of God, you have compassion for the souls of men and women. And you want to make the difference. And, and let me make, make that very clear. You have compassion for the souls of men and women. I, never, I have never gone soul winning to a dog. I've never seen a dog down the street and try to give it the gospel. As a matter of fact, 
I think even in today's world, if somebody saw me going through the gospel presentation to a dog, they'd think I'm pretty nuts. So why would you give your gospel presentation to a sodomite? Why would you be a sympathizer? Why would you let them in your church? Why would you even engage them if they're the equivalent of a dog? Anyways, I mean, I, I, I just, it, didn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. It says, verse 23, And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. This gives us, we are exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. We're exalting God by pulling others out of the fire. And, it, and then it shows to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You know, and I want to just close out with that. Just, you know, sodomites are unnatural. They, they go after the same gender attraction. And then when it's, that's not enough because it's never enough, they're going to go after the children. And then when that's not enough, they're going to go after the animals. And then when that's not enough, well, I don't know. I, I, I just, that's all I know. But the Bible says that they could imagine even more wickedly. That's why God destroyed the world, you know, in a flood. And that's why he gave us the rainbow. But then the other thing is it matters because it solidifies your authority. You know, our authority is the King James Bible. Our authority is the Word of God. And if the Word of God says it, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. And if you say that you believe in the Word of God, then this should matter. And if you say that you preach the Word of God, then it definitely should matter. And if you're preaching the Word of God and you're touching the subject, then it doesn't matter to you. And I don't care how much you tell me that you're out there leading people to Christ. I don't care how much you tell me that you care for souls. I don't care how many programs you tell me you have or how many people come to church or how much money you give. If you can't stand firm on the tough things of God, you, I don't care how you stand on the rest of it. Because it, 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 you're just... Your foundation is set on sand and not on the rock. You know, it matters because it solidifies your authority. It matters because all sodomites are reprobates, but not all sodomites, but not all reprobates are sodomites yet. They're headed down that road, so stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your time with those individuals. And it matters because we're, we're, we are to pull others out of the fire before they get there. You know, ultimately, our purpose in life is to get saved and lead others to Christ. You know, and if there's a stumbling block, we should talk about it. And let me tell you, this is a serious stumbling block. I was on my way to this trip, and I, I fly a lot through Southwest for my business, so I have a Southwest membership, and, 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 I, uh, and that's where I buy my tickets most of the time. And I get to uh, uh, Houston Hobby, and one of the kiosks is covered in this filth, promoting this filth. And it says, don't touch. And I really think that it says, don't touch, because any normal person, even those that aren't saved by grace and that don't have the King James, would probably want to destroy that because the majority of people are sick and disgusted by this. They're just too afraid to stand because of the consequences. They're just, you know, they're not smart enough. You know, even Pharaoh, even Pharaoh was smarter than most Christians today. Pharaoh was like, look, oppress the Israelites because there are too many and if they figure it out, we're in trouble. You know what? If Christianity figured it out, sodomy is in big trouble. Sodomy is over. Now, it's never going to go back the way it, that it was back when we were growing up. But the one thing is that we can at least deter it from getting worse in our families and in our churches and in our congregations. I can't tell the world what to do, but I can at least implore you, exhort you, reprove you from the Word of God with sound doctrine and authority that this is a bad lifestyle and that not only should we preach against it, we should preach it correctly. We should tell all of its truth from the psychopath tendencies to the fact that they, they hate pureness to the fact that they're abusive and that they're going after the innocence of people and that they're unnatural and that they're dogs and that they're beasts so that you don't waste your time with that. Because if you're out there and your goal is to lead others to Christ, this is not the group to do it with. But also, to engage them in that battle and to push back against them. And you know, God says He will deliver us. And He has delivered Christians throughout all the generations. Why is He going to stop now? If, I mean, if God is, if we're once saved, always saved. I like the way that Pastor Burns has said it one time. Uh, he said, 
look, if we're if we have eternal security, then if he's gonna if he's gonna protect us for all eternity, why is he gonna take care of us here on earth? Like it just wouldn't be consistent with his message. And it's and it and it is, you know, David has never he never saw the, the, the righteous forsaken. So we need to know what the basic definition is. And maybe this wasn't such an exciting reprobate doctrine uh, sermon. And maybe this wasn't such an exciting sodomite sermon. But, you know, sometimes you just got to go back to the basics. You know, I remember one time I took trigonometry, which I am horrible at math. I mean, I really love it. I try. And, and, and to this day, I'm still one of those people who's going to try learning math more. But I just never made it past trigonometry. And I was failing. And uh, my, I actually, I was in college and I got a tutor. I got someone to teach me, and guess what they did? They went back to the basics. I couldn't even get to trigonometry. They gave me a bunch of algebra to go through before I could start looking at the trigonometry because I was so bad at the trigonometry, I had no good foundation. Well, it's the same way here. You can't, you, you can't understand why you feel the way you do, why society's brainwashed you the way it has, because you don't understand what a sodomite is. All you hear is that they're gay and happy and that they, you know, they just want to be left alone. The reality is they're much worse than that. And I've showed you with clear scripture how these people think. Right? Correction, how these dogs think. They're not even people, they're just brute beasts. You wouldn't give the gospel to a dog, so why would you give it to a sodomite? You know, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the word today. Thank you for establishing the authority in our lives. Thank you for reminding us that sodomites are reprobates, and reprobates that aren't sodomites will eventually be sodomites. Thank you, Lord, also that it matters because this is our purpose in life, is to pull people out of the fire. And this is one of the things that you warn about that will be a stumbling block and will lead people down uh, a deceptive road. Either the world will be deceived and then eventually become reprobate, or those that are saved will be deceived to not pursue it correctly, and then those individuals that are lost will then eventually become reprobate anyways. So regardless, we need to preach on it to be clear on where we stand and people will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ through that preaching. But thank you so much for those leaders uh, this weekend, Lord, that preached hard. Thank you, Lord, for, for uh, not only those that I went to go see, but let me start here. Thank you for Pastor Cobb because I wouldn't preach like this if he didn't preach like this. Not in this church, at least. I'd have to go somewhere else to look for this doctrine. But Pastor Cobb's preached hard on this, on this subject. He believes what the Bible says as much as I believe what the Bible says. Probably more. He's, he's uh, been preaching for way longer than I've been alive. Lord, thank you for, for all those in the, in, uh, in the new IFB movement, at least those that are standing up. You know, some are, some are more public right now than others, but they've all preached it. You know, and, and it takes me too long to go through all the names, but I'm grateful for men like that that encourage others like myself to stand up and to uh, strengthen our backbone and to be uh, grounded in the Word of God. I appreciate leadership like that. The Bible says to esteem others better than ourselves, and I esteem those individuals, but not just the preachers, Lord. All those that are out there that don't have a church and they serve in a church that doesn't think like they do and they're still willing to stand on the Word of God and go soul winning and preach these doctrines and stand up and be persecuted by themselves because it's, it's real easy to preach all that at a conference where we have three, four hundred other members that think like we do. But when we go back to our homes and, and, and we're in our congregations and some of them are smaller or we, we're in a church that doesn't even think like we do, that's tough. So thank you for men that give them the strength and the tools to fight those battles. We, we're grateful for all that you do, Lord. Give us a good week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.